Hi, welcome to AP Chem Speed Review. We're going to talk about Unit 6 and a little bit of Unit 9, all about thermo today. This is about a little less than 10% of the average AP exam. Here's what AP says. The laws of thermo describe the essential role of energy and help us predict the direction of changes in matter. We see energy in, in virtually all chemical processes. Thermo tells us that energy is conserved. It's just transferred in the forms of heat and work. Chemical bonds is, is key to chemistry. Breaking chemical bonds requires energy, so it takes to break, but forming bonds frees or releases energy. So it takes to, to break and it frees to form. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the favorability of a reaction using our thermodynamic ideas. So the first thing to grasp is the difference between endothermic and exothermic processes. Now we understand that temperature indicates energy change. So a change of temperature indicates an energy change. And we're going to see later that temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy. Energy changes in a system can be described as endothermic, which is taking in energy, or exothermic, energy exiting uh, the system in processes such as heating or cooling, phase changes, or chemical transformations. So in endothermic, we have heat coming into a system, for example, this ice cube, from the surroundings. So if the system is cooler than the surroundings, heat will flow from the surroundings into the system, the ice cube. If the system, say a flame, is hotter than the surroundings, then heat will flow from the hot thing to the cooler area, the, the surroundings, from, so from the system to the surroundings. The energy of the system either decreases in a chemical reaction, in which case it releases, energy exits um, the reaction, or energy increases, in which case energy goes into the reaction or it stays the same. So here's the key concept, uh, especially in this first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's just moved around. And so if heat is lost somewhere, then it must be equal to the heat that is gained somewhere. So we're talking here about heat energy. Heat energy, uh, if something gets colder, something else gets warmer. And so this is the way we described it that uh, whatever is lost is equal to whatever is gained. It's just going to have an opposite sign. So for endothermic reactions, the system gains energy. System energy goes into the system from the surroundings by heat transfer to the system or by work done on the system. If forming a solution can be exothermic or endothermic depending on the strengths of the IMFs. All right, let's look at energy diagrams as a way of, of describing these endothermic and exothermic processes. So here we're tracking potential energy on the left, and here we're starting with uh, a, a, a relatively higher potential energy for our reactants. And just like we saw in kinetics, these um, uh, most reactions require overcoming the energy of activation, getting over the energy hill, before the reaction proceeds. And in this case, the reaction starts at a higher potential energy and goes to a lower potential energy. And that difference between the potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of the products um, will be expressed as energy being released, exiting the, the system, exiting the reaction. And so this will release heat energy. On the flip side, in an endothermic reaction, if our reactants start with lower potential energy, but end up with a higher potential energy after overcoming this even higher energy hill, then this difference between lower reactants and higher products has to be energy absorbed. And that will be uh, energy that has to be taken in to make the reaction occur. So that's energy into the reaction. So it's going to cost us energy. Uh, and this is energy coming out of the reaction. It's freeing energy. So let's just look at this. Um, again, we're looking at stored 
chemical energy, potential energy. Yeah, if we go from something that's low to high, we have to add energy to the system. If we start with something high, it's going to release energy as it rolls down. So think about this, you know, rolling a rock up a hill versus rolling a rock down a hill. In fact, I think I've got some pictures of this. Uh, and why does this happen? Why do exothermic reactions happen? Well, because when something goes from higher potential energy to a lower potential energy, uh, it's more stable. And, and the universe likes things to be energetically stable. So it likes to shed energy from high potential situations and get into a lower, more stable potential. So look at this rock here, for example. Uh, this rock is balanced. It's stable. But is it as stable as it could be? Right, we would say this rock looks pretty precarious. It looks like it wants to fall over. So its potential energy is high. And it, 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 you can look at it and you see, man, that rock really wants to fall. It would be much more stable if it fell. Look at this roller coaster at the top of the um, where this high part is, right? Uh, it took a lot of energy to push this up to the top here. And does this look stable? Or does it look like it wants to either fall backwards or forwards and get off this high hill? And that's in fact, that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, compare this rock here with this rock here. Which rock looks more stable? Well, the one that's, that's fallen, right? The one that's come down the hill and, and shed its uh, potential energy, gone from a high potential energy to a lower state of potential energy. This rock is more stable. And that is what we see. That's why rocks roll downhill. So if you have, if you have um, a, a hill and a valley and you have a, a, a rock on both, here, this you could see, you could see this is less stable than this, and this rock has a tendency to want to roll down the hill to a lower, more stable, more energetically stable position, and, and that's why reactions like to go uh, from high to low. They like to be exothermic. Here's another example, just taken from some of our chemical glassware. Uh, oriented this way, this Erlenmeyer flask is stable, but flipped up on its top. It's unstable. It's in equilibrium, but you can see that, that it would take a lot less to dislodge this than to dislodge this. Okay, so we can look at the transfer of thermal energy in terms of molecular collisions. Particles in a warmer body have a greater average kinetic energy. That's what temperature is, the average kinetic energy, uh, than those in a cooler body. And so Th those particles um, are moving faster, and as they move, they're going to uh, collide with other particles. And that collision uh, is going to give energy to the cooler particles and speed them up. Uh, we often look at a Boltzmann distribution graph, um, that, and this shows us uh, how average kinetic energy is directly proportional to temperature. So at a low temperature, the particles have less kinetic energy. To warm up, they begin to have more average kinetic energy and, and even more average kinetic energy at, at a third higher temperature. Um, if we increase the temperature of a sample, notice that the distribution becomes stretched out. It has a lower peak, uh, but, but it, it has to stretch out because the, the area under the curve has to remain the same. If we're talking about a mole of each, then the particles, the, the number of molecules, doesn't change. So as the temperature goes up, this curve is going to shift lower and to the right than a comparable colder sample. So collisions um, result in a transfer of energy. And this is called heat transfer, or heat exchange, or the transfer of energy as heat. Eventually, thermal equilibrium is reached as the particles continue to collide and reach the same average kinetic energy. Hard. So if I, if I put two metals in contact, a hot metal and a cold metal, heat will spontaneously move from hot to cold. We'll look at this also again a little later when we talk about entropy. But if you put a hot thing together with a cold thing, eventually they will both reach the same temperature. That's thermal equilibrium. At thermal equilibrium, the average kinetic energy of both bodies is the same, thus their temperatures are the same. 
So let's talk about heat capacity and calorimetry. We talk about how to calculate the heat, uh, and we abbreviate that as Q, absorbed or released by a system, system undergoing heating or cooling, based on the amount of the substance, the heat capacity of that substance, and the temperature change. So this is how we, we define heat capacity, specific heat capacity, as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance by one unit, usually one degree Celsius. Um, take a look at this. This is, these are, these are, this is a bigger piece, let's say, of marble and a small piece of marble, uh, which will have the ability to absorb more heat. Well, obviously, the heat capacity of this larger piece of marble will be greater than the heat absorbing capacity of the smaller piece of marble. But when we talk about the specific heat capacity, then we talk about how much one gram or one kilogram uh, of this marble can absorb. And in that case, we don't care about the sample size because we're standardizing it for a specific uh, standard size. So we would say, you know, maybe uh, you know, the specific heat capacity for marble is, you know, one joule per gram or something like that. Okay, the heating of a cool body by a warmer body is an important form of energy transfer between two systems, and the amount of heat can be quantified by our heat transfer equation, which is Q, the energy transfer equals the mass times the specific heat capacity times our change in temperature. Q equals MCAP. That takes us to calorimetry, which is a way to measure, experimentally measure, the heat transfer. So it, it takes lots of different forms. This is a bomb calorimeter. Uh, but in any case, what, what you have is you have, you have a, a place for a reaction to occur. That's the system. And then we have something around it. That's, that's the surroundings. And if this creates heat, then the heat created in, by this reaction, say a combustion reaction, will then... Um, move and, and, and that heat released will move and warm the surrounding water. And we can calculate the change in temperature of the surroundings caused by the exothermic release of heat in this system. And of course it can work in reverse. Uh, maybe this is absorbing heat in this, which case the surrounding water will cool down. So the first law of thermodynamics states that energy is conserved in every chemical and physical process. It can't be created or destroyed. It can change form, uh, but the total amount of energy remains the same. So go back to our rock situation, right? This has a high potential energy because it's up on the edge of this cliff. It has zero kinetic energy, but if it falls off the cliff, some of that potential energy is going to be converted into kinetic energy. And as the rock falls, its potential energy will decline and its kinetic energy will uh, increase. Uh, likewise, if we take a potato, um, a potato uh, in an oven, if the potato increases in temperature, it's only because it has absorbed uh, an equal amount of heat that the oven has transferred to it. So again, energy is not created or destroyed. It can only change where it is or change its form. Now, the transfer of a given amount of thermal energy will not produce the same temperature change in equal masses of matter if those matter, if those masses have uh, differing specific heat capacities. So water, for example, will absorb more heat energy per uh, gram than, say, iron. So we, we are, we, we're very careful to look at the specific heat capacity of whatever it is we're Heating a system increases the energy of the system. That makes sense. Cooling a system decreases the energy of the system. Right? So heating adds energy, cooling removes energy. And so we use what's known as the specific heat capacity of a substance, and we also use what is known as the molar heat capacity in energy calculations, especially involving energy curves. So here is a heating curve. Uh, could be for water or anything else. And what we see here is if we say, let's say we have a solid ice, we're going to use uh, Q equals MCAT using the specific heat capacity of ice to calculate what it would take to change. So let's say we start here at negative 10 degrees. Uh, 
what energy would it take to raise this ice 10 degrees to the melting point? And then, depending on how many moles of this we have, we will use the molar heat of fusion to calculate. So let's say we have 18 grams of water, then that's the, we'll put 18 grams times the specific heat capacity of water times our 10 degree uh, temperature difference to find the, the energy it takes to increase the temperature of that ice by 10 degrees. Then we'll turn our grams into moles, happens to be one mole, and we'll multiply by the molar heat of fusion. Then once all the ice is melted, notice the temperature doesn't change here, only the phase. Then we're going to take the water and heat it up again using a different specific heat capacity. And then when we start boiling, we'll use the molar uh, heat of vaporization. And then when we get all everything to a gas, again, we'll use uh, the specific heat for uh, vaporous water, that, that water is a gas. So we would use in this, if we, if we started you know, 10 degrees below zero and went to 10 degrees above boiling, we would use five different calculations to get the total heat it would take to go from ice to, to, a, to a steam at, say, 222. Uh, if we went in reverse, we would use the same five uh, calculations, but to calculate the energy released if we went in the opposite direction. Okay, so chemical systems change their energy through three main processes. We've already talked about this heating and cooling phase tr uh, transitions. We saw both of those in that heating curve and chemical reactions. So let's look at the energy of phase changes. We've already talked about this uh, a little bit in brief. Uh, if something goes from a solid to a liquid, it has to change its phase. It has to fuse or melt. And so we talked about this as the process of fusing or melting. And we talked about the molar heat of fusing or melting. Uh, another phase change here would be vaporization, water going from liquid water to a gas. And we call that vaporization. So if we're heating it up, it's vaporization. But if we're, if we're going in the reverse direction, it's condensation. And if, instead of melting, we can go in the reverse direction and, and we'll call it freezing. So these are our uh, inverse relationships. And, and as you would expect, the energy it takes to melt is precisely equal to the reverse energy that has to be taken away for something to freeze. So these are the same magnitude, but just have a different sign. Here we're adding energy to force the melting. Here we're releasing and getting rid of energy to allow the freezing. We can track the Q of undergoing a phase change by using um, the molar enthalpy of the phase change. Uh, and we, and we, we, make a, and we, we would use the specific heat to track the, the temperature change. So those are going to be different calculations, as I said before. Energy must be transferred to a system to cause a substance to melt. So it takes energy. Ice has to absorb thermal energy in order to melt. Water has to absorb thermal energy in order to boil. So the energy of the system, therefore, increases as it goes a, uh, undergoes a solid to liquid or a liquid to gas phase transition. So that means melting and boiling are endothermic. We've got to add energy into them to make them happen. Whereas the reverse systems are exothermic. So we add energy to melt something. We add more energy to vaporize it. But if it's now vapor, and then we, we, we cool it to condense into a liquid, and we cool it further still, to uh, cause it to freeze into a solid. As I mentioned, a system releases energy when it freezes or condenses, which is the opposite of it melting or vaporizing. And we call that an exothermic reaction. It has to give off energy. So here are the six different uh, phase changes that can happen as something goes from a solid to a liquid, say ice, it melts, then from a liquid to a gas, okay, it vaporizes. Uh, then it can go from a gas back to a liquid, to condensation, from liquid back to a solid, to freezing, and it can go directly, right? It can sublimate from a solid to a gas or depose, uh, or sometimes called reverse sublimation, back to a solid. The temperature of a pure substance remains constant during a phase change. So look at this. We're tracking temperature. Uh, as, as long as it's a solid, 
the temperature will change. But the moment it hits its melting point, as we add more and more energy to it, it does not at change temperature. All that energy is used to effect a phase change, to disrupt the intermolecular forces that are holding that solid together and now turning it into a liquid. Once every part of it is liquid, phase change is over, then it will heat again. So the addition of more energy will cause another temperature rise until it gets to another phase change. Again, more energy, but no temperature change. So, so think of it this way. Energy either increases temperature or causes a phase change, never both at the same time. So if it's not causing a phase change, it will increase temperature. If it's causing a phase change, it will not increase temperature. It will remain constant. All right, as I said before, the energy absorbed during a phase change equals the energy released during a phase change in the opposite direction. And so we track those with these different calculations. Okay, an MCAP for the solid, an MCAP for the liquid, an MCAP for the gas, a delta H of fusion, molar heat of fusion, and a molar heat of vaporization. All right, now let's talk about the enthalpy of a reaction. And again, enthalpy just means the heat absorbed or released by a system during a chemical reaction. And as we said, it's related to the amount of the substance that we have, the moles that we have. And we call it the molar enthalpy of reaction. So the enthalpy change of a reaction gives the amount of heat energy released if it's an exothermic reaction or absorbed those values will be positive if it's an endothermic reaction by a chemical reaction at a constant pressure. So we're going to track these, this, this change in, in, in heat energy. So if, if it goes, if the system gives off heat, we're going to go from a, a state of higher potential energy down the energy hill to a lower state. If on the other hand, um, the system absorbs heat, takes energy in from the surroundings, then it's going to go from um, a lower state to a higher state. And that is going to be a positive delta H, a positive enthalpy, uh, because we, we're having to add energy into the system to get it to go. Here, we're releasing energy. So it doesn't, it's not costing you anything. It's costing you negative energy. You're getting an energy refund. So let's look at what's known as bond enthalpies, the energy to break and make chemical bonds. So imagine that these are like magnets. Okay, um, those that 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 those two H's are very strongly attracted to each other, um, and to and to break that attraction requires an input of energy. Just like if you had two magnets stuck together, you'd have to add energy to pull them apart. But then if you let those magnets get close together, they would release energy um, as they slammed back together, as they pulled themselves back together. So that's the same kind of energy idea we need to talk and think about. It takes energy to pull chemical bonds apart, but you get energy back when you let those chemical bonds reform. And so we can calculate the energy change that it takes to break all of the bonds in the reaction. And then we can also calculate the energy that is returned when we reform those bonds. And our mnemonic for this is it takes energy to break bonds, but it frees energy to form bonds. So it's going to cost some energy. You've got to invest some energy to pull the bonds apart, but you get energy back um, when you let them reform. And if you get more energy back than it costs to break, then you release energy in an exothermic reaction. If it costs more to pull them apart than you get back by the forming, then you had to invest. You had to put energy into it in an endothermic reaction. So we can use what's known as a bond energy table to look at the average bond association energies. And so it doesn't matter whether we're making or breaking this bond. If we're breaking the C to C bond, it's going to cost us 347 kilojoules per mole. But if we reform a C to C bond, we're going to get that back. And so basically, 
um, you can just keep track of, of the energy it takes to break all the bonds of the reactants and then the energy it takes to reform all the bonds of the products. And the energy difference is the energy of the reaction. The higher the bond energy, the stronger the bond. A stronger bond indicates a more stable, a lower potential energy state for the atoms in the bond, and therefore more energy to push them out of that, that, that lower value. During a chemical reaction, bonds are broken and or formed, um, and these events change the potential energy of the system. And so we can estimate the whole, the, the average energy released in forming all the bonds. Um, and so here would be a, uh, an energy calculation based on bond enthalpy. So when we form water from hydrogen and oxygen, so we're going to take two H2s and one O2 and break these bonds and then reform them as OH bonds um, in water. And so we look, well, how many bonds do we need to break? Well, we have one HH bond and another HH bond. So two times four, uh, 436. And we're breaking one OO double bond, and that's a 498. So the cost, the total cost, in the energy investment to break the bonds is 1370. What do we get when we reform those bonds? Well, we're forming four, right? One, two, three, four OH bonds. And when we form that bond, it's going to release 464 times four. So it's going to cost us 1370 to break all the bonds and the reactants. But we get back 1856 when we reform those bonds. And so the enthalpy change is simply uh, the difference between what it cost us in the beginning and what we got back at the end. So just think of it as, as, as like a, a lemonade stand, right? Here's what you had to buy. Here's what you had to put out to, to get the lemonade and the cups. Um, and this is what you got back after you sold. And so what's your profit? It's the difference, right? It's the difference between this and this. In this case, you have released um, 486 kilojoules energy. So this negative sign means it was it was exothermic. Why? Because you got more back out of the forming than you put into the, the, uh, the breaking. So that's the definition. If, energy, if more energy is released than was required to break, then the reaction is exothermic. But if more energy is required to break than is released, then the reaction is endothermic. Let's talk about the energy changes associated with, with formation reactions. Uh, we're going to talk about um, energies of formation. What is a formation reaction? Well, uh, it's also called the heat of formation. It's, it's basically the, the, the energy change associated with forming one mole of a compound from its constituent elements in their elemental forms. So let's talk about the delta H, the change in energy of, of formation for creating, making methane. Right? So it would be the energy change associated with forming one mole of methane from its constituent elements, carbon and hydrogen, in their elemental or their standard forms. So we'll use graphite, carbon, and, and uh, two a, diatomic H2 molecules to form one mole of that. That is a formation reaction. The standard state of a substance is its pure form at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. And so when we measure the energy of formation, uh, it's known as the standard enthalpy of formation. And if, so that's if we measure it in its standard, in its standard state. And remember, we're forming one mole of the compound from the elements in their standard states. So here is a, a formation reaction for ethanol, and it's depicted in this following uh, thermochemical equation. Okay, so to make ethanol, I've got two C's, so I put two C's over here. I've got a total of six H's, so that's three H2s, and I've got one O. So oxygen comes as a diatomic, so I need half of this diatomic. Now notice, I'm not going to multiply this whole reaction through to make this a whole number because that would give me 
two moles of product and the, uh, a formation reaction is limited to one mole of product, which means if I have to use a fraction, I'm stuck with using fractions, right? And it tells me that this the, the energy change of formation uh, releases 277.7 kilojoules per mole. Uh, and notice it's okay in a formation reaction to use fractional coefficients you have to. All right, so why do we care about uh, the, the energy, the enthalpy of formation? Well, we're going to learn about something called Hess's Law, which tells us we can use the, we can use this to calculate the enthalpy change for any reaction if we know all of the, the, the energies of formation of all the reactants in the products. And basically, we can just sum up all of the products, uh, the energy it took to make all the products, and subtract all of our reactants. So there's our final state. We subtract our initial state, and we get the, the delta H of the entire reaction. So, so formation reactions are very, very powerful ways to figure out the energy change of a reaction without ever having to do the reaction. You can tell what it's going to be based on what it costs to, to form uh, each of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the reactants in the products. So we can use tables of standard enthalpies of formation to calculate the standard enthalpies of reactions. And again, like we did before, we take, so the delta H of any reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the delta H's of the products minus the sum of the delta H's of the reactants. So we we'll use enthalpies of formation tables. Now notice some of these, you know, most of these will have uh, values, but some of them will have a zero. Okay, why? Well, that makes sense, right? How much energy does it cost to get liquid bromine in its diatomic form? Well, that's how bromine comes, right? At standard temperature, uh, at room temperature, bromine is a diatomic liquid. So it costs me no energy to get bromine in the form that it's already in. Okay. Likewise, it costs me no energy to get carbon in its graphite form. It cost me no energy to get iodine in its diatomic form. It cost me no energy to get oxygen, if we've got it here, in its diatomic form. So that's by definition. The standard enthalpy of formation of the most stable form of any element is already zero because it costs no energy to put something in the state that it already exists. So the delta H for formation for graphite is zero. The delta H of formation for hydrogen gas is zero. The delta H for formation for oxygen diatomic gas is zero. Now, if it was liquid, that would be different, right? But if it's in its natural state at room temperature, I, I don't. it takes no energy to convert it. Okay, let's look at a calculation of a heat of reaction. So let's calculate the delta H of this reaction, uh, the combustion of methane, using the delta H's of formation. So we're going to calculate CH plus 2O2 yielding carbon dioxide and two waters and since we have a chart here that gives us the delta H of formation of every one of these. So we're just going to add up the products. So the delta H's of carbon dioxide and, and two waters. Okay, so that's going to be you know, two of these and, and one of these. And then we're going to subtract the, the, the sum of the, of, the, of the delta H of formation for all the reactants. Okay, and so in this case, it's going to be uh, uh, you know, 373. That's the carbon dioxide plus two of these minus uh, a negative 74. You crunch the numbers on that, and the delta H for the whole reaction is negative 890 kilojoules. So we did that by just plugging in our delta H's of formation for each of these things. Whatever its number is, you plug them in. You, you take products minus reactants. You take your final situation minus your initial situation. All right, so a couple important rules. Um, we can also have enthalpy of combustion. So just like we can have formation reactions, we can have combustion reactions. And that's simply the enthalpy change that occurs when we completely combust one mole of the reactant. So here we're going to take a carbohydrate, um, hexane, I think, and we're going to react it with uh, all the oxygen we need to get complete combustion. And, and that will have a standard enthalpy of combustion. You can use those just like you use enthalpies of formation to calculate uh, the 
the energy change of the reaction. So again, remember, remember the enthalpy of formation um, is the enthalpy change that occurs when we form one mole of a product from its elements in their standard states. All right, now this takes us to Hesse's law. All right, let me give you an example. You got three different guys. Bill works his whole life, retires at age 55, and diligently saved up $20 million. Donald makes and loses a fortune multiple times. Um, but eventually, at age 55, he has a personal wealth of $20 million. Conrad is poor his entire life, but the day he retires, he wins the lottery and has $20 million. So even though they live their lives completely differently, at age 55, they all had the same amount of money. So it didn't matter what they did during their lives. The end result is at age 55, they all are worth 20 million. Okay, well, this is going to help us understand um, Hess's law, which basically says, uh, we don't care how many steps a chemical or physical process takes. We only care about where it finally ended up. I don't care how many times you won or lost your fortune. I just care about how, what did you end up, what was your final number at the end. And so that's Hess's law in a nutshell. Uh, and going from a particular set of reactants to a particular set of products, we don't care if that reaction took place in multiple steps or if it took place in one step. The total energy difference is the same. And so we can use this. That's, that's why we can use that reaction that we saw before, formation reactions, because Hess's law says, we don't care how you got there. We're just breaking bonds and making bonds. And at the end of the day, we want to figure out the energy in versus the energy out. And we subtract it, and that's the energy of your reaction. So Hess's law of heat summation says the enthalpy change of a physical or chemical process depends only on the starting conditions and on the ending conditions. We don't care what happened in between. It's like if you go into the casino and you gamble all night, I don't care about the 500 bets that you made, right? And I'm just gonna say, hey, what did you start with? I started with $100. What'd you end up with? I ended up with $300. Great, you're up, you're plus $200 for the night, right? I don't care about all your individual bets and, and how you went up and you went down and up and down and everyone, we don't, I, we just know, bottom line, you're up 200 bucks because I just took your final condition, 300, I subtracted your initial condition, minus 100, and you're up 200 bucks. Same way, energy changes are independent of the pathway, and they don't care about the number of intermediate steps in the process. They just care about what was the energy of your starting condition, what was the energy of your final condition. So two principles in Hess's law. If you reverse a reaction, if you run it in the opposite direction, then the energy is going to reverse. It'll be the same magnitude, but it'll be reversed in sign. So if, if a reaction running this way, um, you know, normally as it's a combustion reaction running this way, if it releases a lot of energy in the combustion reaction, if you run it backwards, it will have to it will absorb a lot of energy. So it'll be exothermic uh, in the forward reaction and endothermic in the reverse reaction. And, and, and Hess's law doesn't care. So you can flip a reaction as long as you flip the sign, Hess doesn't care. Secondly, you can add two or more reactions together to obtain an overall reaction. And you can just add the individual enthalpy changes together to get the net enthalpy of the overall reaction. So you can flip equations, you can double equations, you can cut equations in half. As long as you, whatever you do to the reaction, you do to the delta H, Hess is fine. And your, and your, and your results will be fine. Okay, so let's use a Hess's law example. Let's calculate the delta H for the combustion of methane. So here's methane combusting with oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. But they don't give us any of those things. What they give us is they give us formation reactions. So here's the formation reaction of, of, of uh, methane. And here's the formation reaction of carbon dioxide. And here's the formation reaction of H2O. How come they don't give us a formation reaction for O2? Because it's in a standard state. So it doesn't cost me anything to form it. It's already preformed. 
So you need to know that. That's why it doesn't have a delta H of, of formation because it's, it's already formed. And so you need to know that. You need to know why it doesn't have a number because its number is zero. And so basically, um, what we can do is we want to build this reaction. Uh, we want to build this reaction. So the first thing we're going to do, here is our, here is our goal reaction. Well, look at this. We, we have CH4 on the right, but where do we need it? We need it on the left. Hey, that's okay. Hess says I can flip this reaction all the way around. So I'm going to flip the reaction. And as I flip the reaction, I'm going to flip the delta H. It's a negative 74 here. I'm going to turn to positive 74 here. So instead of running the, the formation reaction this way, I'm going to run it as an unformation reaction, okay? And, and, and put the CH4 on this side, which is where I want it in my goal reaction. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm looking at my reaction here. I need to get carbon dioxide on the product side. So I look here, this second reaction has carbon dioxide on the product side. So I'm just going to not change it at all. I'm going to leave it alone because that's what I want. In my goal reaction, carbon dioxide's here. So it's here. So I'm just going to bring this reaction down. I don't change the delta H, so I just stack on whatever it was before is what it is now. Okay, now what about water? Well, water is on the right side, but I don't have enough of it. So I'm going to double this whole reaction and also double the delta H. And so now I'm going to bring that down, a double. So what I did, I flipped this reaction, flipped the delta H, brought this reaction down unchanged, kept the delta H unchanged, doubled this reaction, doubled the delta H. And now, whatever thing, whenever something appears on both sides of the reaction, I'm going to cross them out. So look, I've got carbon here as a product, carbon here as a reactant. Uh, I've got... Uh, here we go. I have, I have H2, two H2s as a product, two H2s as a reactant. So I can then cross those out. So whatever appears on both sides get, gets crossed out. Then I'm going to add whatever's left together. So I'm going to get methane plus two O2s, yielding carbon dioxide and two H2Os. Voila! So I've created my goal reaction by manipulating through Hess's law these uh, smaller reactions and I can combine them all together to create my goal reaction and then I just what if I sum up uh, my new reaction and I sum up the delta H of that reaction. When products of a reaction are at different temperatures than their surroundings, they exchange energy with the surroundings to reach thermal equilibrium. Right? So we've already talked about this thermal energy transferred out exiting the system to the surroundings is an exothermic reaction. Energy transferred in from the surroundings to the system is an endo. So exo going out, endo coming in. And so exo is going to be releasing heat to the surroundings. An endo is going to be absorbing heat from the surroundings. So it's going to be costing us heat which is why this is plus delta H. It's costing us heat uh, in this reaction. But here, it's, it's costing me negative heat. I'm getting a heat refund. So that's uh, a rebate. All right, that takes us to the second law of thermodynamics. I love this quote. Nothing in life is certain except death, taxes, and the second law of thermodynamics. Remember, the first law is that energy lost is equal to energy gained. So it's just, it's just transferred around. But we, should, we might ask ourselves this question. Why does heat always flow from hot things to cold things and never in the reverse? It, heat never goes from something cold to something hot. The cold thing doesn't get colder and then heat up the hot thing to make it hotter. It, the, the hot thing loses heat. The cold thing always gains heat and, and never the reverse. Why? Well, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Heat cannot itself flow from a colder body to a hotter body. That's one way of stating the second law of thermodynamics. It will always flow from hot to cold, not in the reverse. Now we can make it flow from cold to hot, which is what we do in a freezer or a refrigerator, but it costs us energy to do that. Okay, Coffee, it cools down on its own spontaneously. I don't have to cool it off, right? 
the, the difference in temperature between warm coffee and the cooler air will cause that thermal transfer of heat. So here are the th three most common ways to state the second law of thermodynamics, which and it can be stated in lots and lots of different ways. Heat always flows from a hot body to a cold one. Heat cannot be completely converted into work. There will always be losses. This is especially important in physics and engines and stuff. But here's the one I want to focus on. Every system becomes disordered over time. Another way of stating this is that the entropy, the disorder of the universe, is always increasing. Notice how this is different from the first law. The first law says energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's always conserved. But the second law says something called entropy, which is a measure of disorder, is going to only and always increase. The universe is going to get more and more disordered over time. And there's nothing you can do about it. So here's a, an example. If I have two different gases, okay, gas A and gas B, and they're separated, and I remove this separator, the gases, without me doing anything else, will just spontaneously mix on their own. They'll mix completely until you have a new homogeneous mixture of these gases. And that wasn't because of an enthalpy change. It didn't go from high enthalpy to low enthalpy, right? And it wasn't because of intermolecular forces, right? With gases, we know that IMFs are negligible. So why do these gases mix, right? You open the valve and you have gas A and gas B, and, and gas A is going to come start sliding over here to B, and B is going to start sliding over into A's container and they will spontaneously mix. Enthalpy doesn't change, doesn't, doesn't account for that. Intermolecular forces don't account for that. And if I put the separator back in, will the gases separate themselves back like they did before? You know that they won't. So what drives the mixing? And what makes that mixing spontaneously irreversible? They just won't spontaneously unmix after they've mixed. Why does water spontaneously flow from a higher level to a lower level? It's entropy. Why does a stone go down automatically but never up? Entropy. Why does air leak from a balloon on its own? Entropy. Entropy. Here's the entropy statement of the second law of thermodynamics. In all spontaneous processes, the entropy, the disorder, the randomness of the universe increases. So entropy is defined as a measure. It's not exactly the same as disorder, but it's associated with the disorder of a system, the randomness of a system. If disorder increases, then entropy increases. So if disorder goes up, then entropy goes up, and that it becomes more and more positive. So we, we define a change in entropy as delta S, just like we try to define a change in heat energy as delta H. And if entropy goes up, disorder goes up. If we could take carbon dioxide from a solid, which is a very rigidly crystalline structure, and we go to carbon dioxide as gas particles, have we increased or decreased disorder? Well, we've massively increased, right? Because before they were all stuck together in a lattice network, and now the, 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 the molecules are just they're going everywhere they want, 1,000 miles an hour. Okay. So the delta S, when we go from a solid state to a gas state, is massively positive. Only entropy comes easy. <laughs> Everything else is hard, especially fighting against entropy. It's hard to reconcentrate the gases and separate them, but it's so easy to let them just flow together and mix. Entropy is what describes um, the, 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 uh, the direction of processes. So if I told you that this happened first and then it went to this second, you would say, no, you lie. Right? There's no way that this was the first situation and then uh, a, a little bit later, this was the second situation. Right? Because we never, this is a much more disordered, disorganized, random state for the water to be in. 
And it would never go from a, a random state of distribution like this into a more ordered state. You know that it's actually the reverse. This had to come first. We had a more ordered state and then this balloon broke and the water began to distribute because of entropy. It, made, it went from an ordered state to a less ordered state. Stephen Hawking said, you may see a cup of tea fall off a table and break into pieces on the floor, but you will never see the cup gather itself back together and jump back on the table. The increase of disorder or entropy is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction to time. So time is not reversible. And while Hess says these energy changes are reversible, you're going to see that, that something called entropy or disorder is not reversible. No matter what you do, the overall distribution um, and, 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 and deconcentration of energy is always going to increase. So you know which one is first and which one is last, right? This isn't the first picture and, and this glass is coming together. You know that it started here organized and as the opera singer you know, sung her shattering note, uh, this glass begin to, begins to break and, and go into a more disordered state. The second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as the statement that if you throw a tumbler full of water into the sea, you cannot get the same tumbler full of water out again. Right? You throw a glass of water into the ocean, you can't get all those molecules back right? because they're going to mix. And it was effortless to distribute them, but it would be incredibly labor intensive to get them back. You probably could never do that. So entropy, how do we define it? Um, we define it uh, mathematically as the number of microstates or the number of configurations that microscopic particles can have uh, in a particular system. So basically the more different ways a particle can exist or vibrate or move, uh, the more microstates and therefore the more entropy. So there's another statement of law of thermodynamics. In all spontaneous processes, the entropy of the universe increases. So entropy always goes up. Even if in one part of the, of the, of the universe entropy is going down, for example, photosynthesis, that is a thermo, th thermodynamically uh, unfavored process. It's, it's, it's decreasing uh, entropy. It's increasing order. That's being driven by an increase of energy from the sun. But if you took the energy of the sun and the energy of the earth, you would see that overall the energy of the sun and earth together is dissipating, even though in the particular area uh, where we have you know, chlorophyll and, and trees, um, we are working against entropy. But overall, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. So we can look at randomness as associated with the various physical states. Um, solid things have a very rigid crystalline structure and therefore fewer ways to move and fewer different microstates. So solids are going to have a much, much lower entropy than, say, a liquid. So if we go from a solid to a liquid, entropy is going to uh, increase dramatically. And if we go even further and go from a liquid to a gas, there'll be even a much greater increase in entropy. If we do the reverse, if we cool a gas down to a liquid, that's going to decrease entropy. If we cool it even further from a liquid to a solid, that is going to decrease in entropy as well. An increase in entropy favors a spontaneous chemical reaction. A decrease in entropy is working against the way the universe runs. Um, and, and so here are some ways that entropy increases. When we, when we do a, a change of state, when we go from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas, massive increase in entropy. If we take a substance and we divide it into parts, say we dissolve it, we take uh, sodium chloride and we dissolve it in water, that is going to increase entropy. We're increasing the, the, the places that those, that those um, ions can, can go. If we uh, increase the total number of product molecules, 
if that is greater than, than, the, than our reactant molecules, um, that is an increase in entropy. If temperature goes up, right? remember temperature is directly proportional to average kinetic energy. Uh, so as temperature goes up, the movement goes up, and that's more microstates and more entropy. So all of these changes involve particles becoming more disorganized, more random, or moving into larger volume or something like that. All right, so let's think about the third law in thermodynamics in view of the second law. If a change in temperature, if an increase in temperature causes an increase in entropy, what would a decrease in temperature cause, right? So if we go from a gas, say, to a liquid by decreasing the temperature, we are decreasing our entropy. And if we kept doing that, going from a liquid to a solid and cooling that solid, at some point we would get to an absolute minimum of entropy. And that would, that would occur at absolute zero. And, and so you can see, if an increase in temperature gives, it creates more entropy, a decrease in temperature will ultimately give rise to a minimum, a minimum entropy uh, at absolute zero. And so we can define, we define the value of entropy of a completely pure crystal. We say that it's zero at absolute zero. And so that is our reference point for all entropy. We, we, so there's no such thing as negative entropy. Uh, the, the lowest entropy can get is zero if it's a perfect crystal at absolute zero. Anything above that is going to see an increase in entropy. So review of the th first three laws of thermo. First law, energy is always conserved. The amount of energy in the universe remains constant, just like the law of the conservation of matter. But the law of second law of thermodynamics says any process will tend to increase the amount of entropy or chaos or randomness in the universe. So energy remains constant, but entropy only and always increases. And the third law of thermal is as temperature approaches absolute zero, the entropy of a system approaches its absolute minimum. Uh, remember... Entropy, this increase in energy, this increase in microstates, this increase in randomness and disorder, uh, that is one of the two driving forces behind spontaneous processes. Remember, we talked about the tendency to, to achieve a lower energy state through enthalpy change, right? through an exothermic reaction, as something goes from a high potential energy to a lower potential energy. Another driving force behind spontaneous processes is for that energy to be distributed among more and more states, for that energy to be uh, uh, less concentrated and more distributed, and that is entropy. And so these two factors help drive spontaneous reactions, but sometimes they work in opposition. Sometimes Enthalpy wants to uh, become exothermic, release energy, but to do so uh, it, it is at the cost of, of uh, entropy uh, decreasing. So we have to figure out which one of these factors is going to predominate. And so Gibbs came along, a guy named Gibbs, and he decided to, to, to study spontaneous processes and relate spontaneous processes to these two driving factors. Now remember, a spontaneous process is it, it happens in one direction. It'll, in one direction, it will, it will happen without the addition of any energy. And it will be spontaneous in the reverse direction. So a good example of this is, is iron. Iron likes to rust. If you just leave an iron nail out where it's exposed to oxygen, it will slowly, uh, spontaneously rust. But you never see rusty things spontaneously unrust, right? So it's spontaneous in the rusting direction. It's non-spontaneous in the unrusting position. Okay, so we want to relate those two concepts of enthalpy change, 
where the universe likes exothermic reactions, and entropy change, where the universe likes an increase of entropy. So it likes to, to have a negative delta H to, to, to shed or release energy, but it likes to have also a positive delta S to increase uh, the randomness and disorder. And so this equation, this is called the Gibbs free energy equation, uh, the delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, and, and Gibbs free energy just means the energy that's available to do work. And so if this number is negative, if I have available energy, it means I will have a spontaneous reaction. So a negative G, like a negative H, is energy that is free to run around and, and, and make stuff happen without the addition of any extra energy. So a negative G, delta G, is a spontaneous reaction. A positive delta G means the reaction is not spontaneous. Or you can say it would be spontaneous in the reverse direction. All right, so delta G is equal to delta H minus temperature times delta S. All right, so this Gibbs free energy relates our concept of, of energy change in a reaction and our concept of entropy change in a reaction. So I said before, if G is negative, the reaction is, is spontaneous. If G is positive, the reaction is non-spontaneous. If G is zero, then neither the forward nor the reaction process is favored. There will be no net change. The reaction is at equilibrium. And we'll talk about equilibrium in Unit 7. So um, why is it negative? Well, for the same reason that delta H is negative. If it's negative, it's it's freeing up energy, it's 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 losing energy from the system, and that work that energy can now go into the universe and do something useful. So, our useful energy is going to be our total energy available minus what we lose to disorder or entropy or um, the mess of the universe. So we can calculate the effect of temperature on spontaneity um, and calculate the, we can predict the sign of delta G um, by looking at the signs of, of delta H and delta S. And remember, when we go back here, right, we, what we want, in order to get a negative G, right, that's when we have get free energy, ideally we would have a negative delta H and the, this whole thing here would also be negative. Well, we get that if we multiply this negative T times a positive S. So we, we get a negative term here, and then we add together another negative term. So a negative plus a negative has to give us a negative. So that's the ideal situation. So here we have a negative H and a positive S that gets reversed by the equation. And so this ends up a negative plus a negative makes delta G always negative. So at any temperature, uh, this reaction will always be spontaneous. So what we've done here is we've given the universe both of the things that it wants. Right? It wants to shed energy with a negative delta H and exothermic reaction. It wants to increase the randomness and disorder of the universe through a positive uh, entropy. If you give the universe both of the things that it wants, it's happy and the reaction will always be spontaneous. Conversely, if you give the reaction nothing that it wants, nothing that the universe wants, if you have an endothermic uh, delta H that's costing you energy to make the reaction go, and you're decreasing the overall entropy of the universe, then this reaction will never produce a negative delta G. Okay? And it will be non-spontaneous at all temperatures. Or another way to say it is the reverse reaction will be spontaneous at all temperatures. What if you give the universe one of the things that it wants not the other. Well, it wants a negative delta H. I'm happy about that. But a decrease in entropy is also going to work against it. But to keep that number as small as possible, we want, we want T to be as low as possible. Therefore, the, the positive effect of this doesn't outweigh the negative effect of this. So at low temperatures, the reaction will be spontaneous. 
And if we give it the reverse, if it's a positive delta H, which the universe doesn't like, but a positive entropy, which the universe does like, um, if this number, if, if the temperature is high enough, this negative number will outweigh this positive number and give you a negative delta G. So at high enough temperatures, this will be spontaneous. So you need to memorize this table of signs and show which ones will give you a negative uh, delta G or an always positive delta G or a negative at low temperatures or a negative at high temperatures. Remember that all of these functions, delta H, delta S, and delta G, are called state functions, which just means that they only depend on the state of the system, its beginning state and its ending state. And we don't care about the pathway you took to get there. So, for example, a person standing on the roof of a building has a fixed potential energy. And that doesn't depend. It just depends on his height above the ground. right? And it doesn't matter how he got there, by, by, by ladder or by helicopter, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so these are examples of state functions, potential energy, pressure, volume, temperature, uh, delta H, uh, delta G, delta S. Those are all state functions. And so we just have to figure out uh, the final situation, and we subtract the initial situation, and the difference is the value. So that's why these uh, calculations all look the same. Right? The delta H of a reaction, if we're using formation reactions, it's going to be the delta H of the products, your final minus the delta H of your reactants initial. Delta G of the whole reaction is going to be the delta G final minus delta G initial. The delta S of a reaction is going to be the delta S final minus the delta S initial. Okay, so the key concepts for this chapter. Uh, heat leaving a system, an exothermic reaction, is associated with an increase in stability. Okay, the, the rock wants to roll downhill. Water wants to flow downhill. Uh, and, and to push the rock uphill or to pump the water uphill takes energy. So that's energy in. So exothermic reactions are associated with, with um, greater stability because it's getting rid of energy. It's getting it lower. Endothermic reactions are the opposite. Heat has to go into the system, and they're associated with a decrease in stability. Right? They're going up the roller coaster. Okay, exo are going down the roller coaster. All right, remember the energy gained in a reaction uh, or, 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 or a system, right, is equal to the energy lost by the surroundings and vice versa. So we often quantify that. So remember, energy is not lost, right? It's always, it's conserved. So if it's lost somewhere, it's gained somewhere else. So we can say that the energy of a system, whether it's positive or negative, is equal to the the energy, the opposite energy of the surroundings. So if this is if this is gained in the system, it's lost from the surroundings. If it's lost from the systems, then it's 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 gained in the surroundings. So they're going to be equal in magnitude but opposite signs. Energy diagrams are a great way to show the difference in starting and ending potential energy in an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. Remember that temperature is equal to average kinetic energy. So an increase in temperature increases average kinetic energy. A decrease in temperature decreases average kinetic energy. Um, and remember, as we see later, an increase in temperature is going to always increase uh, entropy. Things that start out different temperatures, if left in contact, will achieve thermal equilibrium. This is the basis behind our calorimetry. Uh, experiments and our calculations, and in them we talk about the Q, the energy transferred, is equal to the mass of the object times its specific heat content, specific heat times the, the change in temperature. Uh, and that's those are what calorimetry experiments look like. Remember, the first law is that energy is always conserved. So if it's lost somewhere, it's gained somewhere else. Uh, we we look at the uh, energy associated with phase changes and things like heating curves and cooling curves. And we use both uh, Q equals MCAT for temperature changes, and we use molar heats of, of fusion and vaporization for phase changes.
we can look at the enthalpy of the whole reaction um, in a couple of different ways. We can look at the energy it takes to break all the bonds of the reactants and then make all the bonds of the products. Uh, remembering our, our, our little saying, it takes energy to break, it frees energy to form. So we can just we can just take the difference between the energy it takes to break all the bonds and the reactants uh, and, and, and see what the difference is in the energy we get back when we reform all the bonds of the products. We can also look at what's known as the enthalpy of formation by looking at formation reactions, which form one mole of a product out of uh, its constituent elements in their standard states. And we can um, just take the product of, of all the things that we form, the final situation, um, the energy of, of that minus the energy of the initial situation to form all the reactants. And that gives us the delta H of the reaction. And this is also another way to express Hess's law of summation. We don't care how we get there. We just want the difference between our, our final state and our initial state. So in Hess's law, we can add the steps and add the enthalpy. We can reverse equations and reverse the enthalpy. Triple equations, triple the enthalpy. So whatever you do to any partial equation, you just do the same, same thing to the delta H. That takes us to our second law that the energy of the universe, while it doesn't change, does like to get more dispersed. And that tendency is known as entropy. Entropy is what causes heat always and only to flow from hot to cold. It, it's what causes the universe to always increase its randomness and disorder. It causes reactions to only and always go from more order to less order if, if it's spontaneous. So entropy and enthalpy, that is dis, an increase of disorder and a decrease in energy, are the drivers of chemical reactions, and we can relate them together in the Gibbs free energy equation. Remember that um, entropy will always go up if temperature goes up, if the volume in which we're, we're looking, considering goes up, if moles go up, um, if, if the number of particles goes up, or if there's a phase change, particularly from a solid or a liquid to a gas. That is a massive increase in entropy. And we can, we can get to the third law, which is if entropy increases as temperature goes up, then entropy must decrease if temperature goes down, and it goes to zero if we have a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. Remember that these are the drivers of reactions, and they're all state functions. So we can talk about you know, the state function of delta, delta H, it's products minus reactants, delta S, products minus reactants, delta G, products minus reactants. Uh, here is the Gibbs free energy equation that relates to those three. We, we saw how to predict the sign of delta G. Remember, delta G is spontaneous if it's negative. So we have to combine these uh, different possibilities uh, to get a negative delta G to get a negative, or sorry, to get a spontaneous reaction. If delta G is greater than zero, it's non-spontaneous or spontaneous in the reverse direction. If it's zero, then it, there's not a tendency in either way the reaction is at equilibrium. And that is it. Thank you for your time.